Hey there, and welcome to uh, our deep dive on esprit de corps. You know, when I first saw this topic, I thought, okay, military morale, got it. But um, what I found fascinating was how this term, which, you know, originated in the French military, it kind of seeped into these philosophical debates. And it really reveals a lot about, I think, the anxieties of the time. Yeah, it's true. Esprit de corps, it's like a linguistic fossil, you right. know? When you dig into its history, what you uncover is not just these changing definitions, but these evolving anxieties about group dynamics and like their impact on society as a whole. And to help us kind of dig into all of this, we're going to be using Luis de Miranda's book, Ensemblance, The Transnational Genealogy of Esprit de Corps, as our guide today. It's an amazing book. It's packed with all of these examples of how Esprit de Corps popped up and everything from 17th century French military writings to Enlightenment philosophy. Well, and that's what makes it so fascinating, right? I mean, this wasn't just some term that was confined to the barracks. You know, you, it became this key concept for understanding the very fabric of society from like the courtly salons to even, you know, the heart of the French Revolution. And speaking of the Enlightenment, Voltaire himself weighed in on this whole debate back in 1755. And he was careful to distinguish between esprit de corps, like the spirit of a group, and esprit de parti, the spirit of a party. It seems like a subtle difference. So what was the big deal for Voltaire? Well, Voltaire, he was concerned that esprit de parti, you know, fueled by self-interest and ambition, could actually be harmful to the common good. He saw it as a potentially divisive, mm. you know, less about national unity and more about specific groups just grabbing power. And this was a time, don't forget, when the influence of groups like uh, the Jesuits was a major point of contention. The Jesuits. They always seem to pop up in these discussions about esprit de corps. What made them such a lightning rod for this idea? Well, they embodied this kind of, this tension, I think, that's at the heart of esprit de corps. I mean... On the one hand, they were admired for their discipline and effectiveness. But on the other hand, critics really questioned their loyalty. They suggested that, you know, they were more beholden to the Pope than to their own nations. And so it really sparked this debate, right? This debate of when does group loyalty become detrimental to the larger good? Yeah. It's like that age old question of how far would you go for your team mm -hmm. makes you think about, you know, even the downsides of even the strongest group bonds. Yeah. But this debate didn't disappear with the Enlightenment, right? I mean, the French Revolution, with its emphasis on individual liberty, I mean, that must have really shaken things up. Did revolutionaries just try to completely erase this idea of esprit de corps? Well, it's not so simple. While the French Revolution championed individual liberty, it also recognized the need for a new kind of unity, you know, a shared sense of national identity. So it's not that they were rejecting esprit de corps outright. It was more like they were trying to redefine it, to make it about, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité, the spirit of, of shared purpose and citizenship. So it's less about eliminating esprit de corps and more about redirecting it towards a common good. Yeah. But I imagine that wasn't always easy, especially with somebody like Napoleon on the scene. Oh, absolutely. Napoleon's rise is a fascinating example of how quickly that narrative can shift. Because here you have, you know, the very ideals of the revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity being harnessed to build an empire. And Napoleon, he understood the power of esprit de corps. He used it to foster national unity and, of course, to fuel his military campaigns. It shows how the same concept can be used for very, very different ends. It's almost like esprit de corps is this adaptable concept, you know, uh -huh. able to be molded and reshaped across different eras and ideologies. But what I'm really curious about is, like, the tangible ways that this idea actually played out in history. I mean, we've talked about the French Revolution and Napoleon, but what about some earlier examples? Well, one of the most vivid examples, and perhaps one of the earliest we have, comes from, well, you guessed it, those legendary swordsmen, the French musketeers. Of course. Yeah. There's a writer named Germain de saint -Foy, and in his 1732 book, Lettres de Nadim Koja, he actually praises their esprit de corps. He highlights how, you know, their shared experiences, their code of honor, even their distinctive uniforms, all these things contributed to their unity and their effectiveness. So we're talking about the real deal musketeers here, not just Dumas, you know, romanticized version. Exactly, the actual musketeers. That's fascinating. And it makes sense, right? Like those uniforms, rituals, they can be powerful tools for kind of building that sense of us versus them. Oh, absolutely. Those visual markers, you know, along with specialized language, rituals, these things can really solidify a group's identity. And, you know, this can be incredibly unifying for those on the inside. But it also raises that question we talked about earlier. When does that inward focus become maybe um, 
a little too exclusionary, even potentially harmful. Right. Like with Voltaire's concerns about esprit de parti and the potential for groups to put their own interests above everything else, it seems like this tension has been this recurring theme throughout history. Mm -hmm. But I want to shift gears for a second, jump forward to like the Industrial Revolution. With the rise of factories and mass production, did those old guilds and their traditions, which often relied on esprit de corps, did they just fade away? Not entirely. While industrialization you know, brought about massive changes, those anxieties about group loyalty and the potential downsides, they didn't disappear. In fact, you could argue that some new concerns emerged. Think about the rise of labor unions, for example, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Okay. Workers organized, right, they demanded better conditions, fair treatment, and this collective action, well, it required a really powerful sense of solidarity, a kind of esprit de corps that fueled their movement. So it's like the very forces that were dismantling these traditional forms of esprit de corps were also giving rise to new expressions of it. It's fascinating how this concept just seems to weave itself into different social and political movements throughout history. But as we move into the 20th century, things start to feel even more, I don't know, complex. Oh, absolutely. The 20th century really throws the complexities of esprit de corps into sharp relief. I mean, on the one hand, you have the horrors of totalitarian regimes like Nazi Germany. They exploited this idea of national unity, this collective identity, to terrifying extremes. Right. Think about the propaganda, the mass rallies, the Hitler Youth, all carefully orchestrated to create this unquestioning esprit de corps, very often built on fear and exclusion. It's a chilling reminder of how easily something as powerful as esprit de corps can be twisted yeah. you know, and manipulated for for evil purposes. Yeah, precisely. But at the same time, you know, the 20th century also offers these really inspiring examples of esprit de corps as a force for positive change. Consider the civil rights movement in the United States, for instance. That's a good point. Despite facing incredible violence and oppression, activists drew strength from their shared struggle, their unwavering belief in justice, and their esprit de corps. It wasn't just about individual rights. It was about this collective fight for equality and dignity. It shows how the impact of esprit de corps depends so much on the context, right? Mm -hmm. The goals, the values that are at its core. It's not inherently good or bad. It's more like this powerful tool that can be used for very different ends, which I guess brings us to today. With, you know, our increasingly interconnected world with social media, virtual communities, global movements, has a de core become even more complex? Absolutely. If anything, it's become even more relevant. Think about how people connect online now in virtual communities, you know, fan groups, even online gaming. These digital spaces, they can foster such a powerful sense of belonging, you know, this shared identity that transcends these physical boundaries. But as with any expression of esprit de corps, there's always that flip side. It's interesting you say that because it makes me think about how easily these online communities, you know, they might start around shared interests, yeah. but they can sometimes devolve into echo chambers, right? Yeah. Reinforcing these existing biases, making it harder to really engage in a meaningful dialogue with people who hold different views. You've hit on a crucial point. The internet, for all its potential to connect us, it also has this immense power to divide. And that's really where the challenge lies. How do we harness the positive potential of esprit de corps in our you know, hyper-connected world, while also guarding against its potential to create even deeper divisions? That's a great question and one that feels incredibly relevant to our lives today. But before we you know, delve into that, I think there's one more um, kind of intriguing aspect of esprit de corps that we haven't explored yet. We've talked about its potential for both good and bad, but what about its absence? So we've been talking about esprit de corps as this you know, binding force, for better or for worse. But what happens when that bond kind of unravels? Is there like is there a term for that lack of esprit de corps, like an anti esprit de corps? It's a really interesting question. I mean, you're asking what happens when when the glue dissolves, right? What's yeah. left? Exactly. Yeah. Like, do we just become a collection of individuals, each person just for themselves? I mean, is that what some of those Enlightenment thinkers were worried about all along? Some definitely. It wasn't always about you know groups becoming too powerful. Sometimes the worry was that they'd become too weak too fragmented, you know, to function. Even Adam Smith, like the father of modern economics, he was concerned about this. Wait, really? Adam Smith? The invisible hand guy? The very same. In his book, The Wealth of Nations, he criticizes something he calls the corporation spirit. And he argues that, you know, it can stifle progress because people become more focused on like protecting their own turf than on innovating for the greater good. So it's like this delicate balance you have to strike. 
too much esprit de corps and you risk stagnation. Mm -hmm but too little and you're left with chaos. Exactly. And and finding that balance. Well, it's a challenge that has really echoed through history. Think back to the French Revolution, for example. I mean, mm. they tore down these old hierarchies, right? But they also recognized the need for some kind of, you know, unifying structure. Like they were wrestling with that very tension, individual freedom versus the need for a cohesive society. It makes you think about the challenges we face today with, yeah. with all this talk of polarization and these echo chambers. Yeah. Like maybe part of the struggle is rediscovering how to cultivate a healthy esprit de corps, one that embraces, you know, diversity, collaboration, not exclusion. That's a really powerful insight. We need to rediscover the art of bridge building, of finding common ground, even when, you know, we disagree. Because without some degree of shared purpose, some esprit de corps, well, it's hard to imagine how we'll tackle these complex issues facing us, you know, as a global community. So maybe the real question isn't like, is esprit de corps good or bad? But but rather, how can we harness its power for good while, you know, avoiding its pitfalls? I like that. And, and for you, our listener, perhaps the next time you're in a group, a community, any kind of gathering, really, just take a moment. Think about the dynamics of esprit de corps at play. Is it genuine connection or is it something else? The answer might surprise you. Great advice. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive into esprit de corps. It's been quite a journey, right? Through history, philosophy, even a bit of sociology, all sparked by a term we often just think about with the military. From the musketeers to the French Revolution, from, uh, from Adam Smith to online communities, we've seen how this idea continues to shape our understanding of group dynamics you know, and their impact on society. Hopefully this deep dive has given you, our listener, a new perspective on this concept, this idea of esprit de corps and, and how to maybe navigate its complexities in your own life. Until next time.